I guess I'll just start then. Um, my name is uh, Mark Dowd. I'll be speaking on attacking interoperability. And um, this talk is actually partially written by uh, Ryan Smith and David Dewey as well, who are unable to be here. So it's just going to be me presenting. Um, now, before we uh, start getting into all the subject material of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, we have to address the issue of what, what, actu what we actually mean when we're talking about interoperability. So in this particular context, when we talk about uh, interoperability, I'm talking about the, the glue that basically allows different software components to speak to each other. Um, so basically, you can think of it like a translator between people that speak different languages, you know. Um, they can't understand each other directly, but you have an intermediary who is responsible for um, uh, communicating between both parties. So this kind of interoperability is actually um, used uh, extensively in computers to allow uh, disparate components to communicate directly to each other. And this is a, a very big trend in the, um, in the web browser sphere. Um, you've got like JavaScript that can talk to DOM, the DOM, Java can talk to JavaScript, .NET talking to JavaScript, etc. So there's, um, this, this diagram sort of depicts like a, a large amount of uh, inter interoperability layers that take place in, in your typical web browser. So we basically uh, started looking at this and we thought that um, the added complexity of adding these um, direct communication channels between different components uh, creates uh, subtle, um, new and interesting opportunities to attack the software. Um, it's a pretty large and nuanced attack surface and it's largely hidden um, because it does all its work behind the scenes. So this uh, speech actually targets some of the browser components, um, specifically uh, in the MS world in Internet Explorer. Um, but basically uh, these ideas are applicable anyway where you have, um, it, you know, various components communicating with each other. Um, in, in other pieces of software as well. So the, um, the talk is split into three main parts. I'm going to talk about a technology overview, which is basically a very brief primer on some of the background material uh, needed to understand the second parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about enumerating uh, some of the attack surface, and then we'll talk about some of the, uh, some of the bug classes that we were able to uncover. So we're going to start with uh, Internet Explorer 8, first of all. Um, now, Internet Explorer 8, uh, as you know, is Microsoft's relatively recent addition to their, um, to their browser family. Um, and it varies, it differs quite a bit from some of, some of their previous uh, Internet Explorer uh, releases in that um, basically they uh, designed it with security in mind. Um, it's got additional sec security components that um, when run on Windows Vista or Windows 7, um, they can leverage some features of the operating system to basically uh, limit the amount of exposure that you have to attack when you're, when you're using their browser. So it's called a loosely coupled architecture and basically um, they've restructured it a fair bit so that they can provide a sandbox which is uh, generally referred to as protected mode um, by utilizing uh, integrity levels within Windows 7 or Windows Vista. Um, there's three different uh, primary integrity levels that we're concerned with uh, when talking about IE. There's low integrity which is basically um, what, uh, pros what IE runs in when you're looking at untrusted content from the internet. Uh, there's medium integrity, which is, when you're, which is used when you're browsing relatively trusted content like on an intranet. And then there's high integrity, which is basically an installation broker from, for when you install software. But the whole point of the integrity level stuff is essentially to protect the operating system from the browser in case you, um, in case you get hacked. Um, this is a diagram of, of how they've uh, re-architected Internet Explorer. And um, I borrowed it off Microsoft, actually. But uh, the basic idea is that when you're browsing, uh, when you start open a new tab in Internet Explorer, um, it checks the zone that you're navigating to. And depending on that zone, it will uh, farm out basically the work done by that tab into a process in the, in the relevant integrity mode. And you can see there that um, the, for the, uh, again, the untrusted internet um, content, it'll go into a low integrity process. So I guess we should talk about what integrity levels are anyway. Um, integrity levels is a synonym for mandatory integrity control, which is something that Windows added in um, Windows Vista. And it basically ensures that uh, securable objects on the system uh, are not writable by uh, processes that have a lower integrity um, than the object itself. So basically what happens is um, every securable object has a, a token that describes 
who can access it and how. And um, most of the permissions checking that has traditionally been done in Windows happens with um, access control entry entries in an access control list uh, called a DACL. And um, they check you, and you can basically set, you know, uh, this user can access this object, this user can't, etc. Um, integrity level sort of builds on that by uh, adding an, a, an entry to each securable object um, called into what's called the system ACL. And um, this, uh, this new entry basically has a SID that describes what integrity level uh, this securable object is basically accessible from. Um, now, if, if there's no securable, if there's no SID de, de, um, denoting what integrity level something's available from, then the default is medium, which is basically the access that the regular user has on a Vista or Windows 7 system. So basically what happens now is whenever you try to access one of these securable objects, um, it checks if it's got this um, uh, integrity SID, and if it does, it compares the calling process's integrity with the process of the object they're trying to access, and if the calling process doesn't have um, the same or higher integrity mode, then basically you can't access it for right, for right access. Um, there's also uh, uh, an interesting thing with the way programs are executed as well. Um, when, you act, uh, when, you, when you execute a new program, obviously it will be executed with the same integrity of, of the caller. So if you've got a low integrity process and you um, execute another process, it'll be low integrity also. Uh, there is one exception to this, which is basically if an executable program has has a integrity SID that says it's low, whenever you run that um, executable, no matter what integrity you run it from, it will be run in low integrity mode. And the idea of this is um, if you download any content from the internet, it automatically gets tagged with this low integrity SID. And um, so basically when malware tries to download something and run it, no matter what bugs they leverage, um, and what integrity mode they're uh, leveraging them from. If they try and access this, if they try and run this program they downloaded, it'll be run in low integrity mode, which basically doesn't allow them to write to um, a large part of the file system and registry, etc. Um, so anyway, in in terms of IE, um, they they run this untrusted content in low integrity mode, and this basically means you can only write to low integrity locations. Uh, there's a couple on the file system, and they're like, you know, documents and settings slash user slash application data slash low or something like that. There's, there's like a couple of different directories like that. Um, and you can also only write to low integrity registry locations, which you can see listed on the slide there. Um, where ba so basically it minimizes the amount of damage you can do if you happen to be able to hack into the browser. Um, now, of course, uh, there, there is uh, one, diff one um, exception that IE has, which is uh, some programs actually need to be able to write to files or write to the registry and stuff like that. And so they have a mechanism where it will actually execute things at elevated privilege levels. Um, and to do that, they have this registry key setting um, that you can, you can see on the slide there, where basically you can register uh, a program that IE has to launch and you can give it a policy and that policy determines exactly how IE will launch that process. Um, the, the policy value is, uh, is one of these three that you see listed on the slides. Um, basically a policy value of zero means never execute this under any circumstances. So they have things registered like command.exe um, so that you can never uh, execute that from IE. You can silently launch applications, um, but they will be launched in low integrity mode. Uh, you can um, have it prompt before launching an external application. Um, and if the user accepts, then it'll run it in medium integrity mode. Or you can um, silently launch applications in medium integrity mode. So in this case, I'll those programs will have more access than IE itself does. Um, they actually achieve this uh, uh, utilizing a, a comm server that, that um, one of the higher privileged IE brokers uh, hosts. It's actually got some similar policies for uh, other low integrity requirements, like you can allow certain programs to allow um, drag and drop between integrity levels, and um, you can also uh, uh, you can also designate um, which processes are allowed to, uh, which DLLs are allowed to be launched by run DLL32.exe. Um, so we'll come back to IE in a, um, in a, in a little while, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, ActiveX because that's uh, fairly central to interoperability within IE. Um, now everyone knows what ActiveX controls are. They're basically registered by um, a CLS ID uh, in the registry. 
in the HP classes root directory, and um, they have to have certain restrict they, they have certain restrictions placed on them to to decide what what you're allowed to execute and when. Um, the two main ones that everyone is probably familiar with is the safer instantiation, which means um, uh, the object is allowed to be uh, instantiated from a persistent com stream, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there's safer scripting, which is, uh, you know, you can script the object uh, from JavaScript or VBScript or whatever. Um, now, recent versions of IE actually added uh, more granular control over ActiveX. Um, there's system-wide kill bits, per user kill bits, and you can also actually um, configure like white lists of websites um, or per domain or per user uh, controls over which, um, which ActiveX controls can be executed in different contexts. And this is pretty good for policy management, I suppose. Um, th the last thing you've probably heard of is, of course, uh, kill bits, which is basically a mechanism that um, IE also has where when a ActiveX control is known to be dangerous to be run from an unsafe environment, uh, they can set a registry key and basically um, uh, this, this ensures that, the, that IE won't instantiate this object um, on behalf of the user. Now, ActiveX controls actually utilize COM quite extensively. Um, ActiveX are scriptable objects uh, and they basically expose an iDispatch or iDispatchX uh, COM interface. And um, these, this interface is basically self-publishing. Um, you can find out the names of the functions and properties available. Um, and you basically, whenever you want to actually call a, a method or uh, access a property from that particular control, um, internally the iDispatch invoke function is called um, with an ID that identifies which property or method you want to access. And, um, and then it goes ahead and does whatever it needs to do. Now, the parameters passed to ActiveX controls are actually passed in a disparam structure, which you can see on the slide there. And uh, the most important thing about this is essentially um, it's an array of variants. Um, and these variants are the, uh, are the variables um, that it received as parameters from the scripting language or whatever. Um, so these variant data structures are actually quite important because they're one of the key components of interoperability. Um, they're basically used to represent different data types, you know. Uh, you have, uh, it's, it's a very simple data structure. It has a type variable, uh, which indicates, you know, what type of data is being contained in the variant. And it's got a union, which um, contains the value of the variable. So you might have a type that says it's a string, um, and then the value will contain this, the, the relevant string uh, of what the user supplied. Um, now, the, the type is actually um, not just an enumeration of, um, of numbers. They've got what's called a basic type, and you can see some of them listed in the table there. And these basic types have val values from 0 to OXFFF. Um, and these are, these are the types you would expect to find, like for, uh, you know, integers, strings, uh, dispatch objects, which are, which are com objects, um, Boolean, uh, variant, and so on. Um, you can, but you can also have modifiers that um, modify what type of uh, type is being held in the variant. And the modifiers are basically VT vector, VT array, and VT biref. Um, if, if you've got uh, the VT array bit set, basically um, it says instead of having the basic type being contained directly within this variant, uh, the variant has a pointer to a safe array structure of that data type. So for example, you could have um, a variant that has the type uh, VT array um, ORD with VT bool. And this will say that um, this variant contains a safe array data structure that points to an array of booleans. Um, the other thing you can have is the VT biref modifier, which basically says this is a pointer to the basic type rather than um, being a literal value. So if you had a uh, VT i4, for example, like an integer, um, and you ORD it with uh, VT biref, then um, the value in the variant would point would have a pointer to an integer rather than just a literal integer itself. Um, so when um, I talked before about our safer instantiation, and basically that's all about COM serialization. So basically, um, COM objects can be serialized into flat files and then resurrected at a later point in time. Um, and they can do this by implementing one of a series of uh, of COM interfaces, and if they support this interface, you know, they implement it, and then they mark themselves as safe for instantiation, and then you can actually um, 
read uh, a flat file and it knows how to parse it into an, an object that's resident in memory. Um, the, the, the relevant COM interfaces are the iPersist uh, interfaces basically. And um, in order to support serialization, uh, the object just um, implements this functionality. Um, so persist streams basically uh, receive a pointer to a data stream and they know how to parse it back into a COM object resident in memory. And the function responsible for doing this is the load method in the iPersist interface. Um, now, because everyone doesn't want to re-implement the same thing of resurrecting COM objects and, and um, so on, most people use a com, a, an implementation of the load method that uh, Microsoft provides in the ATL library called ipersiststreamload. Um, and basically what this allows them to do is define a property map where they just say, okay, I've got all these different types of properties and they use some macros that are listed on the table there and um, it will fill out data structures, those ATL prop map entry structures. And then basically the load method goes through, sees what properties it needs to load, and loads a monitor time from the, from the file until um, the object's been completely unpacked. Now the interesting thing um, is that if an ActiveX object is safe for instantiation, you can actually embed these serialized COM objects in web pages themselves. Um, and you can see an example of how to do that. You, um, basically you specify the data parameter in an object tag, and you give it a URL to a file. And um, if, that, uh, if this object that you're trying to instantiate is, s supports uh, comms persist streams and uh, is safe for instantiation, it will go ahead, read the data from that file and try and um, unpack it into memory. So this is kind of an example of basically how it looks like. Um, as in, in this particular case, you know, uh, the programmer is just using the ATL uh, functionality that I described before. So they just have these uh, data uh, you know, these prop data entry macros and stuff where they just say, okay, I've got an integer, um, I, this is where you need to put it, I've got a uh, name, etc. cetera. Um, and, you can s and basically you can see that uh, this translates into a binary representation that, that you can host via the object tag. Um, so that's a really brief primer on some of the technologies that we're going to be concerned with. We actually wrote a uh, pretty in-depth paper about all, all this kind of stuff. So if you're interested in it, you'll um, probably find uh, a lot more information um, in, in the paper that we wrote, which I'll give you a URL to later. So if we're looking at the attack surface, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff to attack. Firstly, there's the DOM implementation itself. Um, the code that implements the DOM functionality, there's, there's quite a lot of it. Um, there's ActiveX controls, um, and I mean, they've been targeted a lot in the past, but uh, if you consider the safe for the instantiation, the IPersist stream stuff, that stuff's been targeted uh, very, very little in the past. Most of it has been the, um, the, script the scriptable interface that objects uh, expose. You've got uh, language runtimes themselves, both the native functionality and the marshalling code. And then you've got uh, trust boundaries, which is basically um, when security mechanisms are, are, are implemented, uh, where, where are the boundaries where they start trusting uh, other objects, and we'll talk more about that a little later on. But we'll look at uh, the DOM implementation first. So this is actually a really large um, code base, and it's implemented within mshtml.dll. Um, it has to expose all, this, all, the, all the functions that you can call from the DOM um, are in, implemented natively in mshtml, all the marshalling code that basically um, takes, takes input from anything that can interact with the DOM, whether it be JavaScript, VBScript, uh, .NET, etc. It takes all that, it has to um, marshal it, do type resolution, um, and it has to be able to marshal the outputs as well. Um, now an extensive amount of this functionality is, is reachable via scripting, so it's uh, a very large attack surface. Um, and basically uh, the, the DOM utilizes COM internally quite extensively, um, much like ActiveX where they have a, uh, a dispatch function used to uh, uh, access methods or, or parameters or et cetera. Now what I found out when I was looking at um, the DOM for IE is that uh, objects uh, are actually published via a class descriptor. So every, every object that is available in the DOM um, actually uh, extends from this C-based um, C class, which is not externally com visible. Um, but each of these, but each uh, class has a 
has a function called cbase uh, get class desk, which returns a class descriptor. And this class descriptor actually contains all this information about how the object can be manipulated. Um, basically, it contains all the property information, all the method information, um, you know, and uh, specific uh, specifics about each of those methods and properties, like you know, a disk ID and um, enum info versioning, etc. Um, this is kind of a diagram of how it's laid out in memory. Um, but the important thing is that via the class descriptor, you can get access to this array of hash tables that basically contain pointers to all the property descriptors. And from those property descriptors, we can work out like all the code that's available to us um, via, via the DOM. Um, now, this has got a, uh, a basic printout of this, what the structure looks like, the property descriptor. Um, but basically, we can use this property descriptor to match um, what code is available in the DOM with the native code in MSHTML. And most of this is done via the flag field. It's got this flags field, and part of it is used as an offset into a global table of IIDs, um, which are used extensively for COM, right? And um, basically, what you do is you get the IID that they point to, and then um, you do a query interface on the object um, that's a, that, that this um, object, the, the, the object that you're querying, um, for that particular IID, and then you get an offset from the flags field as well, and that offset is an offset into the V table returned from query interface, and that is a pointer to the native method that handles the functionality that. Um, for the property or method that you're looking up. Now, if the IID offset is zero, then they actually use a default IID that's available from the class descriptor. Um, now, of course, you can't just call these methods directly. They have to do all this marshalling to ensure that the parameters they received is actually the parameters that they're expecting um, from JavaScript or whatever. And uh, again, this is passed as an array of disparam, uh, as passed as a disparam structure, which is essentially an array of those variant data types. Um, now, there's this marshalling layer that exists and, um, within uh, MSHTML, and it has the responsibility of doing this type checking and conversion uh, to make sure that um, you know, they, they're getting the data they expect. Um, and all these marshalling routines are basically in a big uh, globally accessible table, which you can also see in the slide there. So what happens is, when you actually call one of these DOM properties or methods, um, they basically call this, um, this uh, marshalling routine. It does the type checking, ensures everything's OK. Internally, it calls the native function um, that I was talking about before that actually does the work. And then, um, and then the, na and then the uh, marshalling function you know, marshals the result back to the, back to the user. Um, and of course, if there's errors, it does cleaning up and stuff like that. So we have to find out what the appropriate marshalling method is, as well as where the native code is that actually implements the properties that we're looking for. Now, in the property descriptor structure, they actually have an index into this global table of the marshalling array as well. So we can actually find out um, which marshalling function is going to be used for which, for which um, property or method that we're going to be accessing. Um, and as a result, uh, we basically know that um, because they're using this particular marshalling method, we know uh, what kind of data types are being expected from that function and what, what kind of data types it's expecting to return and everything. So we can actually figure out uh, where the native marshaller is, where the um, native code is that implements the DOM functionality, and then um, you know what kind of data types it's expecting. So I sort of uh, wrote a program to test this. And you can see that um, this basically prints it all out I've got it in a text file. Um, this is basically prints it all out. You can see that uh, by just querying these class descriptors, we can enumerate the entire DOM, and you can and we can not only find out where the native code is that implements those functionalities, so we can audit them, but you can see uh, all all the data types they're expecting and what they return. So, um, in this particular example, you can see uh, these are all the properties and methods that are available from the ob object tag. So. It's actually got heaps of them, right? And um, you can see um, all, the, all these various ones. You know, child nodes returns a pointer to an object and takes no arguments. Uh, can have HTML, takes no arguments, returns a bool, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we can enumerate all that. And then um, if you wanted to do something like fuzzing or something like that, you could build this into such a tool quite easily. 
Um, ActiveX controls, uh, I don't really want to say too much about because they've been targeted a, a, a large amount in the past and we basically know where the attack surface is. The first and most obvious one, uh, like I said, is by targeting the methods and properties that the ActiveX uh, object uh, exposes itself. And uh, there's many different, um, this, is, this has been done extensively in the past. There's uh, fuzzes, there's all sorts of stuff available uh, for automatically testing these as well. Um, but one thing we found, like I said before, is the iPersist interface, um, when people do uh, instanti support instantiation, uh, is actually very rarely looked at. And particularly the iPersist load function, which is responsible for basically parsing a completely untrusted file, um, is often less explored than, than most of the scripting interfaces and is worth looking at. Um, now, most of the people, like I said, actually use uh, an ATL standard implementation. So um, it actually exposed a large part of the ATL core as an attack surface. Um, and Ryan and David Dewey actually published a number of uh, pretty high profile ATL bugs um, related to some of this functionality uh, just a few months back. Um, but also, e even if you don't have bugs in the ATL itself, having these property maps extend the attack surface, and we're going to look at shortly uh, how that occurs. The last thing I wanted to con consider was sort of the language runtimes because they uh, contain quite a lot of functionality that's pretty useful as well. Um, now, this I'm going to talk about VBScript and JavaScript, but anything that um, interacts with all these uh, these components as well would be worth a look at. You know, like uh, ActionScript and um, Java and all this stuff that can interoperate with with the DOM and these scripting languages. But the the major scripting engines are like VBScript and JavaScript. Um, and they have to do the same sort of thing uh, as, as everything else. They have to uh, marshal, be able to marshal data types correctly. Um, they've got all this native functionality there. And um, basically, if we can uh, enumerate all that automatically, then we have a lot better idea of uh, what's available for us to attack. So in the case of JavaScript, um, actually JavaScript and VBScript uh, have similar data structures to manage all their um, manage their objects internally. They've got this name table class that uh, basically has, um, keeps track of all the symbols available for a given object. Uh, they've got a, a symbol structure which represents a symbol, a, a var class which is basically a wrapper to a variant object like the, like the ones we explored before, and then a vval class which basically uh, has a variant but also is used for name variables so it also has the associated disk by D and, and name of the, the variable etc rather than just a value. So enumeration of both of these binaries can be done fairly similar similarly by manipulating these structures if we know them. Um, in, in terms of JavaScript, uh, native uh, functionality is registered within all the relevant objects. Um, so basically, you know, if you have, you've got uh, the date object in Java and the array object in Java, etc., they all have a, um, a function called uh, ensure built in. And basically, whenever someone requests a symbol of a certain name uh, from JavaScript or whatever, uh, they check if uh, this is one of the built in symbols. And if it is, they, they add it to the symbol table there and they can return it. So all these ensure built in functions are basically um, have all the native functionality uh, registered. Uh, responsible for registering all the native functionality uh, that we can reach. Um, now, now, mostly in JavaScript, they, they use this function called add native method, which basically uh, just, just registers the, the function. But um, you can also directly register functions without using add native method by um, do, you call, calling this function called create vval, which creates one of those data structures that I sort of mentioned in passing before. Um, the good thing about these is they have a fairly, uh, they all have a standard interface. Anything uh, registered with the add native method basically has the same type of parameters. It has a um, C session, which is a scripting session object you can't control. It's got a, a this object, which is the this object that you know the function is associated with in JavaScript. It's got a return object. It's got um, a, an argument count and then an array of the arguments. Um, and in the terms of properties, they, they don't need all that, but they um, have a simpler structure. But basically, um, the point is that th this, uh, this marshalling, the way that they do marshalling is all dispersed throughout the code. So every single function that's exported from JavaScript has to do its own um, marshalling and type checking. They don't have a marshalling layer as such. They just receive a whole bunch of variants 
and, and a count of how many variants the user happened to supply. And uh, they have to go through and verify them all and do type conversions if necessary. Um, the VB script is, uh, is very similar, except uh, all the all, it's actually a bit easier. All the native methods are stored in what's called a static entry point data structure. And they're all available contiguously within the VB script.dll. Um, and basically, this is a very simple structure. It's just got a V table followed by the, the native functionality that they're exposing. Um, Again, all the entry points adhere to a very simple interface. Um, this one just has a return type, a parameter count, and a parameter array. And like JavaScript, every single function has to do its own type checking, etc. cetera. Um, so we can actually uh, utilize those as well. Um, hang on a sec. And you can see uh, it's very easy with something like VB script as well. We can find out where all the native functionality is. Um, we can't find out what the data types are here because we don't have that, the, the benefit of that marshalling layer like the DOM does. But again, we could build this into a tool that like automatically tested or debugged or like we'd know where to audit at least. So um, we're aware of the attack surface. So I'm going to move on to the vulnerability classes and the results. now. What we found is that, of course, uh, these interoperability layers are, are affected by standard bug classes, and that's expected. But I'd, we didn't really want to talk too much about buffer overflows or memory corruption or anything like that, because they've been extensively well covered in, um, in a lot of security literature. So we wanted to concentrate on things that were specific to um, marshalling. Um, now, marshalling has some additional complexities, you know. Um, because they're using a language agnostic variable representation, the variant data structure, um, they have to manage the lifespan of all the data that's being transported into and out of these, um, these marshalling layers. And they have to take into account security models that, uh, that basically they didn't know about when they were designing a lot of these components. Because like with IE, for example, a lot of these security additions came later on and not when these components were first being des designed. So um, these unique challenges that uh, exist within the marshalling layer itself um, present the opportunity for unique vulnerabilities. And the main ones I'm going to talk about today are type confusion and transitive trust vulnerabilities. Okay, so um, like I said, uh, everything is passed by these variant data types and um, basically uh, they're a con what we call a contrived type. Um, and they actually require pretty careful programming. Um, it's very easy to, to get these wrong. And um, so you often end up with vulnerabilities occur when one data type is mistaken for another. So as, as I sort of said before about variants, the actual value of the variant is stored within a union. And as you know, unions are just like structures except every member occupies the same space in memory. So um, the, only, uh, the only way you know what type of data is in that union is by consulting the, um, the, the VT member that, that indicates the type of the variant. Um, and the programmer has to keep track of this uh, of the of the type, and um, it's very easy to get wrong um, because, especially because some of the variant APIs that Microsoft exposes are somewhat unintuitive at times. So the first thing is uh, permissive property maps. Now, um, as as I was talking about before, when you've got uh, using uh, com persistence, they have these property maps. And basically, uh, all those uh, macros that you saw allow you to define, OK, I've got uh, this, um, this data value. It's, it's this type. And um, it goes at this place in the instantiated class. But some of these uh, macros are actually quite permissive in that they let you to, they allow the programmer to not explicitly define a type. They just say, they can just say, OK, I've got this member named first name. Um, and they don't actually have to specifically say it's a string. Um, and in this particular case, if a, if a, when, when they're unpacking it, the, um, the uh, ATL code that loads, loads stuff from the property map has a look, says, okay, I don't know what type this data is, and it reads the type from the stream, and then instantiates an object of whatever type you say it is. Um, now, uh, the, the macros that allow this uh, more, per, more permissive uh, typeless type, type of data is the prop entry and prop entry x macros. Um, the other macros require you to have a type, but um, they they can also be uh, 
used as typeless macros if the type um, is specified as VT empty, because that's basically a wildcard that says just load any type that you want. Um, obviously, this is bad because a small oversight from the programmer and they expect a certain value to be an integer or something, but it's a string or vice versa. Um, and what often ends up is you can either read memory that, um, that you shouldn't be able to or you can uh, uh, cause some sort of memory corruption. Um, the variant API uh, also is, lends itself to initialization errors. Um, basically, they have these two functions, uh, variant init and variant clear. And um, the variant clear function is responsible for cleaning up variants after they've been, um, after they've been used. And how, how that works is it gets the type value out of the variant. And um, depending on what that type value is, it'll either do nothing or it will do some sort of cleanup operation. So if the type is an integer, there's nothing to clean up. But if it's a, a B string, for example, a string, it will free that memory. If it's a dispatch object, like a com object, it will call the release method of that com object. So obviously, if you um, pass a pass a variant to variant clear that hasn't been initialized properly, um, then the type, the type value might be um, an uninitialized member and you'll end up doing something that you might not have intended, such as uh, either um, freeing an arbitrary block of memory or trying to jump to an arbitrary block of memory, which is even worse. So you always have to call this function called variant init before you use, before you, um, use a variant and then you clear it later with variant clear. Now this seems uh, obvious and hard to get wrong, but um, obviously uh, programmers forget it from time to time. But uh, there is actually a, a more subtle variation um, of how to make this kind of uh, vulnerability. And that is that uh, a lot of the variant APIs that uh, have a destination parameter call variant clear on their destination before they do anything. Um, the functions I'm talking about are listed there, variant copy, variant copy indirect, uh, variant change type, and variant change type X. They all take a source parameter, a source variant, a destination variant, and various other parameters. So if you haven't initialized the uh, destination parameter, um, variant clear will be called on it, um, and you know it might end up in, again, freeing an arbitrary block of memory or doing, or jumping to an arbitrary block of memory. These are actually pretty hard bugs uh, to catch in, in the testing phase, because uh, you know a large amount of the time, the, the VT type that they extract from the, from the destination variant won't be anything dangerous. There's only like three or four values that will actually cause it to free memory or something like that. So a lot of the time these bugs can, can go through testing without being caught, but then if you can massage the stack or, or the heap or whatever in a certain way that um, this variant is seeded with a useful type, then you can trigger the vulnerability. So this is a really simple example where it's just uh, reading some data um, out, out of one of these uh, you know, com streams. And um, you can see that the destination variant, they set the uh, variant type to VT dispatch. And they try and read a dispatch object from the stream. Um, but if that read fails, they call variant clear and return HR. Now, obviously, that's bad because they've never called variant in it. Um, so when variant clear gets called, the type is VT dispatch, which is a com object. So they will get whatever happens, um, whatever data happens to be in the variance value member, which is uninitialized, and then try and use that as a com interface and call the release method. Um, this is a this is the variant copy uh, example of that attack that I sort of t talked about before as well. Um, you can see this has got a source and a destination vari uh, variant. They they set both of them to type VT dispatch, um, which again is a, a com dispatch object. Um, they try to read this dispatch object. If it fails, they don't call variant clear, so that's fine. Um, if it succeeds, they call variant copy. Um, and the source vari variant has been initialized properly, but the destination variant, um, the type has been set, but the value hasn't been set. So variant copy calls variant clear on the destination, and um, then you'll be like trying to jump to arbitrary memory, basically. Um, the next thing that can go wrong is that uh, it's really quite easy to misinterpret types, misinterpret types um, when dealing with variants. Uh, if you remember when I was talking about before, um, variants basically con contain a basic type and then some possible modifiers like the VT array type and the VT biref type. Um, the modifiers are actually not mutually exclusive. Um, you can have uh, a variant that is uh, of type VT biref. Um, or VT array or VT bool. 
And basically this means this variant contains a pointer to a pointer to a safe array structure that's, um, that has an array of booleans. Um, so if you don't um, correctly deal with these, uh, with these modifiers, you can very easily uh, create a situation where you're accidentally um, manipulating a variant as if it's a different type of um, a different type of object because you've ignored one of the modifiers. Um, the basic ways this happens is if you mask off all modifiers. I've actually seen some code that does this. It just basically gets the basic type and operates on it as if it was that. Um, obviously, that's uh, really bad because you know you might get something thinking it's an integer when it's really a pointer to an integer or whatever. Um, there's sometimes you can have situations where an action is based on a specific modifier. Um, for example, you might test if VT array is set, and if it is, you start using the safe array API to manipulate the value. Again, that's not right because, um, like I said, uh, VT byref is not mutually exclusive with VT array. So uh, basically, if you did that, um, you will get a pointer to a pointer to a VT array and start manipulating it as if it was an array. Um, and the last situation is if you mask off any specific modifiers uh, and it's very easy to make a mistake where you um, end up using the data type as if it was something else. So this was an example I found in uh, the core of uh, IE's DOM. Um, basically that stuff I was talking about, the marshalling layer, um, has, has this code uh, that um, most of the marshalers call to marshal all their data types. And um, basically, they get each argument and call variant arg to see this function here, and they say what type they want. And um, this function is responsible for checking if the variant that they received is the type that they're looking for. If it is, fine, just return the value. If not, attempt to perform a type conversion. If that type conversion fails, die, otherwise return the converted type. So the problem is here um, is that you can see that they get your, the source variant, which is the variant you can control. And um, they mask off VT byref and VT type mask, which is the basic type. And um, if that's not the same as what they're expecting, well, then they try and do a conversion or die. If it is what they're expecting, just go, just go ahead and return the value. But the and masks that they're doing in that um, bolded part of the code uh, basically accidentally masks off the VT array parameter, the VT array modifier. So if you pass a variant that's like, um, if they're actually uh, expecting a variant that's of type like VT dispatch, for example, which is a com object, and you pass an array of VT dispatches, because they end off the VT array member, they compare um, your variant and VT dispatch, and they think they're the same thing, and then they operate on this uh, pointer to a safe array structure as if it was a, uh, as if it was a uh, com object. And um, obviously, uh, that's quite bad. Um, the last thing you can do is uh, direct type manipulation, and this is when you set VT directly without using variant change type or something like that. Um, this is uh, a very generally bad idea, and um, because if you set the type manually and then call variant change type and it fails, um, very often, uh, even if you catch the error, you're going to call an error routine that cleans up, which ends up calling variant clear, and again, um, that's problematic because the variant is partially uninitialized. Um, and one of uh, Ryan's vulnerabilities that he published in the ATL was exactly this type of problem, um, of which we got an example of here. Um, this is part of the core ATL code. And uh, basically, Ryan noticed that um, they, in this particular situation, uh, they, they read a variant type from, from the uh, untrusted file. and um, you can see that they uh, manually set uh, VT here. And then um, if it's not VTB string, they try and do a change type. And um, of course, uh, if, if that, they return the, the error code. So if they fail, they end up calling variant clear. And uh, what actually ended up happening was you were able to specify B string, and it would actually try and change it to a different type, like a uh, com object. And um, basically, it would confuse the types when trying to clean them up. Now, this is all very well, but you're um, probably wondering how you actually generate all these different types of variants since you can't um, directly you know, create them within Internet Explorer or something like that. Um, the answer is anything that uh, is able to interact with any of these objects gives you options for how to generate uh, different data types. I've got a table here of basically um, 
all the data types that you can generate within VBScript and uh, JavaScript. And the v VBScript uh, type uh, values are in blue, um, and JavaScript is in red. So you can see that there's quite a, an array of different um, variant data types that you can generate using these scripting languages. Um, and you can see that VBScript allows you to create a lot more than JavaScript does. Um, this is basically because everything in JavaScript is basically an object, and that object is an iDispatch object, which is a COM object similar to an ActiveX control, really. Um, uh, but in um, VBScript, everything's represented as variants natively, so you can um, uh, generate quite a few different types of variants, um, and you can even do the more interesting ones down the bottom, such as generate arrays of variants, uh, birefs of variants, and um, uh, even an array, a biref array of VT variants. Um, so this is uh, some examples of how you would actually generate those, given, given the information on that table. Um, and basically, I don't need to go through them all, but you can see that uh, uh, by using uh, any of the functions from the tables, you can, you can create the relevant uh, variant object. Um, now, those, those, uh, there, there's quite a, a number of different variants you can generate using the basic scripting languages, but essentially, um, the more that uh, you can generate, the more feasibility you will have to be able to, to attack these um, interoperability layers. For example, with the DOM control, um, creating an array, you had to be able to create an array of um, dispatch objects, basically. And uh, none of the basic scripting languages allow you to do that. So they've never encountered that test case before, more or less. But by using a, every, every single um, plugin that allows you to you know, interact directly with the DOM or anything like that, gives you more options for how to generate these data types. And I've listed like just a few here. Um, you can see that uh, there's a ActiveX control um, Capicom that Microsoft provides, and that allows you to specifically generate a array of um, UI1s, which is an unsigned byte. Um, and .NET controls actually allow you to create a, a large variety of, of different data types. You can create um, unknown COM objects, um, you can create uh, variant arrays that aren't specifically um, VT variant like, like they are with VBScript. And you can also actually create these variable size structures which are called VT records. Um, but there's a, a stipulation about that. You can't, you can't do it completely freely. Um, so here's an example of how I uh, triggered that one bug. Um, basically, uh, I needed to generate an array of iDispatch objects. I can't do it with uh, VBScript or JavaScript. Um, so the base languages are no help. But by using the .NET interoperability, uh, we can actually do it quite easily. All we have to do is create a class with the attribute com visible true, which basically means this com object exposes iDispatch. Um, and you can see in the .NET code here, um, I, I've got this test class. I create an array of them. Um, and then I pass that array to the, to the browser function invoke script. Um, and invoke script on the web browser control in .NET basically allows you to call a JavaScript function from the .NET control. So this, this array of, um, of classes that I created basically gets marshaled as an array of dispatches, and you're able to trigger the vulnerability. The last thing I wanted to talk about was um, transitive trust issues. These are basically um, issues where uh, you, you are able to leverage the features of a particular plugin or component of the browser to bypass um, security restrictions that are uh, implemented in other parts of the browser or, or other plugins. So because the browser has an evolutionary security architecture, um, you know, the security requirements are constantly changing. And you know, if you add a new security feature into um, IE, something that was fairly harmless in, in something like Flash before might suddenly become useful. So basically, um, this, this trust model uh, gets broken because a lot of the other components don't know what the security boundaries are of the components they're interacting with. Um, so plugins actually provide additional complications because not only do they expose their own functionality, but they might do things like launch other um, you know, uh, COM objects or, or external programs or whatever, which uh, have even less idea of you know, what security features they're, they're supposed to be enforcing. 
So um, that's why we call them transitive trust because basically if the browser ex ex um, explicitly trusts some plugin like um, or, or component and then that plugin or component trusts something else, then the browser transitively is extending trust to the to the to object B that it doesn't really know anything about. So earlier um, this month, uh, Ryan and David Dewey actually they were uh, looking into the ATL and um, and uh, the all, all the different um, instantiation code that we were talking about before, and they noticed that um, that that you were able to bypass the the kill bit feature of Internet Explorer. Basically, um, like I said before. Uh, there's been quite a, a variety of uh, ActiveX controls in the past where just instantiating them within the browser context was unsafe. It would it, you know, uh, allow you to jump to arbitrary memory or something like that. And rather than specifically fix uh, that problem, Microsoft just, just kill bit of them and said, you can't instantiate this anymore. Um, so, uh, but what happened is, um, uh, you know, Ryan and David were looking into persistence and uh, there is a, a large amount of opportunity to create objects from persistence because we have permissive property maps where um, types can be anything, or you can specifically have um, properties where uh, you can specifically have properties where they're actually objects themselves. So the pro if the property type is like VT empty, VT dispatch, or VT unknown, it basically says, okay, um, I have to read a class, I have to read an object from the file here. Um, so it reads a CLS ID of whatever the object is, and then it instantiates that object and tries to tries to load that object into memory. So, um, obvious, so obviously you could pass a CLS ID of a kill bitted control um, in one of these uh, you know uh, data files that was being instantiated using safe for, um, in initialization and you would be able to instantiate these dangerous controls and exploit the vulnerabilities that were thought to be uh, patched by the kill bit protection. So um, there, there was a couple of uh, limitations and requirements for this. First of all, you had to have an ActiveX control that could exist for, that was safe for instantiation. You had to um, have a property that you could load that either had no type, like the permissive property maps, or VT dispatch or VT unknown. Um, the scriptable methods of the object that you instantiate are generally not reachable. However, like I said, in a lot of cases, just instantiating them is bad enough. And um, then basically, the, uh, but the iPersist load function, of course, is reachable. Um, and this was a, a significant problem to fix because it wasn't just patching like a DLL in one location and like, okay, we're not allowing this anymore. But, Basically, everyone that had safer instantiation controls, which is like hundreds of ActiveX controls apparently, um, were all using this code that would, and they might have had permissive property maps and stuff, and they could all, uh, you know, be used as a mechanism to load these kill bitter controls. So it took uh, quite a long time to, to fix. Um, one, one other example here is I wanted to go back to talking about the protected mode stuff. Um, like I said before, uh, there's a lot of plugins that run out of process, um, and uh, they are launched at um, either low integrity or medium integrity. And if their policy was their policy D word was three, they have silently launched at medium integrity level. So exposing any functionality from these plugins pr prevents uh, presents an opportunity to exploit the trust that is extended to that object by using it to escalate past low integrity mode. So I had a look at uh, Java, which runs out of process, um, and this is Java actually registers a number of binaries when you uh, install it um, to run at medium integrity level silently. So the jp2launcher.exe program is is an example. It's used to indirectly launch Java. It gets a path supplied from the command line, appends slash bin slash java.exe, and runs that as medium integrity, right? So that seems good because you can just download a, a program and run it. But like I said before, if you download a program, it's going to have that uh, low integrity um, uh, SID attached to it. So when you try and execute it, it will actually run in low integrity mode, not medium. So that seems like a problem. But what you can do is um, you can go, okay, well, 
uh, local Java class files, if, if you point java.exe to a, a local class file, it will run just like a regular program uh, with local privileges. It can read and write file, execute programs, etc. So instead of like downloading and running our own um, java.exe that's going to be run at low integrity mode, we can actually download a, a class file and point to that um, or alternatively use a, uh, you know, a useful command line property such as changing the class path and we can launch java.exe in medium integrity uh, mode and it will run this class path uh, just as a regular you know, desktop application and it will be running in medium integrity load, uh, mode rather than low integrity mode. So essentially uh, the result is if Java is installed, the IE protected mode doesn't really do anything because you can just run class files um, in medium integrity mode rather than low integrity mode. And I've got a, uh, got a sort of example here. Um, you can see Internet Explorer here is running in low integrity mode. And uh, this is actually exploiting the, um, the, the DOM dispatch thing that I was talking about before. Uh, this, this program actually takes a long time to run because uh, not because it's heap spraying or anything like that, but um, it's actually using a, a UNC paths to alter the Java class path file. But um, I mean, you could do something less lazy and just download the file locally. But uh, basically, what uh, you'll you'll see is that uh, you can see the program running here. When it launches my my Java application, which it just did you can see that my payload.exe is actually running in medium integrity mode rather than low integrity mode. And again, that was just because um, I set the class path to a UNC path and had it download a Java program and, and run it locally. So I've got uh, three minutes left, so I'll just uh, finish the con conclusion. Basically, um, so what we were trying to drive at was that interoperability and continually adding to it has uh, non-negligible security impl implications. Um, the marshalling functionality, getting the marshalling functionality exactly right is, is quite hard. And um, there's a whole other range of problems that I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, we actually talked about them at Black Hat called uh, object retention vulnerabilities is another major area with marshalling. But um, Everyone just adds all this interoperability to each other and doesn't consider the consequences. Um, and the controls interacting with each other not only add the possibility for new vulnerabilities, but they add for the possibility of um, uh, exploiting previously unexploitable vulnerabilities by being able to do things such as manufacture unique data types um, or extending trust to an object so you can exploit a trust relationship um, or something like that. So. Um, and again, this, this, the interoperability layers um, that I talked about are just in the browser, but actually this is an issue that we think extends far beyond the, the browser to many other areas. So um, uh, there's a lot more depth for all the topics that I talked about at, uh, at our paper, which we put up on those websites, tao.ssa.com and hustlelabs.com. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's um, IE actually tags everything that it that it downloads. So um, it it's actually uh, any, anything that comes from a, a remote um, file system, you know, a remote location. Um, oh, so it's specific to the download API. No, uh, no, it's not. Um, I I have the details here somewhere, but it's, it's just like going off the top of my head. But basically, um, it's it's an automatic process and. Um, it's it's quite problematic. I found about it. I found out about it sort of by accident because I expected that bin java.exe trick to work to just execute a standard remote process, but um, it didn't really work out. <laughs> uh, anyone else? I mean, you, you can do stuff like that, but uh, 
the, the Java program is running with, with those permissions in. Yeah, you actually can. Um, this uh, program I'm running, you can see it's actually an exe, and uh, the the Java the Java process um, downloaded and ran that. So um, yeah, you can using Java. Uh, is, is anyone else? All right, well, uh, that's my speech, anyone. So if you've got any further questions, just come up afterwards or something. But uh, thanks a lot.